Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy McDonald. I am a producer, an educator, and an entrepreneur, and I love bringing interviews with experts in fields that matter to you. And today I'm so glad and honored to have with me Joe Slater. He is the owner and founder of Slater Admissions Advising in Sacramento, California. He works with students in all different areas, but he has a specialization in college, I mean, in athletics, um, athletes getting ready to go to college. Is that right, Joe? Did I put that right? Yeah, athletic recruiting is uh, is usually what we call it. Athletic recruiting. And that is an area we as college advisors or high school advisors are asked about a lot of different times. And so tell us a little bit about your background and your experience in working with athletes. Yeah, so I was a high school athlete at one time, um, and uh, and and went through this experience. Uh, you know, I was a baseball player, and all I wanted my entire life was to play baseball in college. Um, but I was not, you know, the natural. I wasn't huge. Um, you know, I wasn't the guy that jumped off the off the page. Um, but I had really no idea how to go through the process, um, and I ended up, uh, you know mailing a couple of VHS tapes, uh, you know, I'm dating myself with that, uh, yeah, to, you definitely are. to some, uh, you know, different coaches around, uh, the country and, you know, didn't get a ton of, uh, of interest back, uh, and then ended up, um, you know, at the local college near my high school, um, knew me because I had been around and hanging around for a while and invited me to come and play with them. Uh, and I decided to take that uh, take that plunge. And it was, you know, one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, you know, the four years that I played in college taught me everything that I know, uh, you know, about the world and all my best friends come from that. And I really believe in the, in the, the college athletic experience as a really important formative experience for people who have the ability to, to, to do it. Um, so I, uh, after I finished playing, I, went over to Germany. Um, and I spent three years playing, uh, baseball in Germany, which oh, is, awesome. you know, an interesting and not very, you know, popular, uh, sport out there, but they bring Americans out to play on their teams, uh, to kind of grow the sport and to, and to teach the locals. Um, and so I started coaching while I was out there. I loved it. Um, decided, all right, this is what I want to do. Um, came back to the U S and got a job at a junior college, uh, spent two years coaching baseball at a junior college, then got a job at University of San Francisco, uh, spent two years there, then got a job at University of Pacific out in Stockton, spent two years there, which is kind of the way that it works in coaching. Um, and then was started was starting a family, you know, uh, getting married, having kids, and was like, I can't keep chasing this dragon all around, uh, all around America. Uh, so I switched into administration um, and I went to UC Berkeley and I spent four years at Cal um, in uh, a couple different roles. I was in uh, sports operations and uh, fundraising and then uh, started to get interested again in, a, in the admissions side because um, I had done that when I was coaching, helping the recruits get into school. And then I had done it in a, in a, a bit in operations at Cal. Um, you know, just making sure that kids are getting through that UC process. All right. Um, and so I worked with Cal to one, uh, do the UC Berkeley extension program uh, for college advising, uh, and then also to do some of the uh, academic pre reads for athletes um, and, and be a bit of a liaison between the athletic department and the admissions office and helping them get through that process and, and helping with uh, personal insight questions and some of the other things that come up in the UC application process. Loved it, graduated uh, from the program and then went out on my own and, uh, and have been working ever since with all different kinds of students and athletes. So you're seeing a lot of different, you've seen it from a personal level and also from a coaching level and an administrative level. So it seems like you've gone through all the different aspects and have that multi-lens approach. So in 2021, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling, the name, image, and likeness ruling that really has had an impact in athletic college sports. 
what is that ruling? What, what, what does that mean? So yeah, the NCAA versus Alston is the, is the actual ruling. Um, and it really just essentially didn't do anything except remove a prohibition that athletes couldn't make money off of their own image, name, image, and likeness. Um, you know, so it's not pay, it's not pay for, like we say, pay for play. Um, you know, the schools are not paying the athletes to play at their school, but the, the, under the old system, everyone had to be an amateur, which meant that you couldn't be making money based on your talent. Um, and so that, you know, had a pretty obvious, you know, application for, you know, someone who was going to be on a Dr. Pepper commercial, you know, or something like that as, you know, it's like, I'm Joe and I'm the quarterback for Alabama and Dr. Pepper is going to give me a million dollars to be in their commercial. But there were a lot of different ways that that also affected people who, who it, it really shouldn't have. I, like some of my favorite examples are like, uh, there's was a guy, Jeremy Bloom, who was an Olympic skier um, and also a really good football player. And he uh, was training for the Olympics and, uh, and getting sponsorships you know, as you do as a, you know, a, a professional skier. Um, and then he got recruited to play wide receiver at Colorado Boulder. And the NCAA told him you have to give back all the money that you received for your skiing sponsorships if you want to play football. And so he went, he played his first year, had a great time. And then he was like, I want to go to the Olympics. And, uh, but he couldn't afford to, you know, fly to Tokyo and fly to all these qualifying places and buy all the equipment. So he took sponsorships again in skiing and then came back to Colorado the next fall. And they told him that he was ineligible and he couldn't play football anymore. And he never got to play college football again. Um, you know, and, and so people take that example and are just like, why does that make any sense? You know, uh, there's other examples, you know, there's a kid, uh, now out at Marshall who was a singer and he was a country music singer in West Virginia, but he couldn't sing under his own name because that was seen as, you know, as using his, his image or likeness uh, to promote himself and make money off of it. And so he had to sing under a fake name and then the NIL rule came out and he got to sing under his own name. So there were some kind of weird uh, cases like that, um, that really pushed it over the edge. And then, you know, the, and the, the, the big changes now that the schools have always been able to make money off of these players. And now the players themselves are able to capitalize on their abilities, talents, you know, on the field and off. And, and they're being treated more like normal students who can, who could always could do that. So do you see other, are different colleges handling this differently? Are some really embracing it and saying, here, here's your opportunity, athletes, you can do this. And other ones saying, no, you know, put the brakes on and we're, we're still not in favor of this. What kind of reception has, has the colleges given to this new ruling? So it's a, it's mostly about resources, about, you know, the schools with the most resources to be able to attack this and figure it out uh, are the ones that have benefited from it the most. And it's, you know, the rich getting richer, like the, you know, the, the Alabamas and Oklahomas and Clemsons of the world immediately were like, you know, the next day, huge announcement, NIL collective program, uh, you know, all of our richest alumni and local business people are getting together and we've got a pot of $50 million that we're going to pay to, you know, athletes to promote brands and do this. And, you know, they were on it right away. Um, wow. you know, other programs just don't have that sort of infrastructure that, you know, it's like, I used to work in an ath in lots of athletic departments. Like there's nobody at, 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 uh, some of those schools to be like, okay, you're in charge of figuring out this NIL thing, this incredibly complex, new, you know, untested situation. Uh, and so they just kind of said, we'll see what happens, you know? And so some athletes went out and made deals and did stuff, um, on their own. And there's a huge difference between the schools that are really, you know, channeling it and promoting it and helping uh, kids and then schools that are like, hey, we, we won't get in your way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. You do it out on your own, but but yeah. we won't get in your way, but we're not going to give you any help either. We just so. don't have, yeah. We just don't have the ability to like, you know, staff that essentially. Mm -hmm. Does it matter whether the students at a div division one, two, or three for NCIA, um, I mean, NCAA or NAIA, does that make a difference? Only as far as the way, the structure of how NIL works, uh, which is very much like, you know, the world of advertising, um, you know, students with visibility benefit the most, you know, the athletes who are playing on in the big sports for the big programs that are on TV all the time are going to naturally attract more, uh, more business, more people who want to give them money to promote their brands and, uh, you know, and drive their cars and do all these things. And, and, and so, you know, it's, and it, it's not even really between divisions like that. Like, you know, there's differences in teams. Quarterbacks are worth more than linemen and mm -hmm. uh, you know, point guards are worth more than centers. And, you know, it's like, it just kind of, uh, you know, it goes from, uh, you know, inside of, inside of a team, you know, between teams, football players compared to uh, soccer players or, you know, inside division one or, you know, SEC compared to the Pac-12, like SEC players get a lot more than Pac-12 players. And those are both, you know, big power five conferences. And then those big power five conferences compared to the mid-major conferences. Um, and then, uh, you know, D1, D2, T, D3, um, you know, really isn't as big of a distinction as those big time football teams to everybody else. You know, like when I was at University of Pacific, that was a lot closer to Sonoma State where I played mm -hmm. like a division lower level, you know, mid-major division one and division two are a lot closer than University of Pacific was to Alabama. You know, it's like that. It's just like a whole different world. Mm -hmm. Does it also um, the like the season? You know, football is fall right now. You know, we just March Madness is for basketball. Um, does it kind of ebb and flow with that too? Um, not really. Not really. I think it's mostly it's mostly about you know exposure, about mm -hmm. TV exposure, fame social media followings, you know, there's some really interesting, uh, cases where, you know, a, like, a, you know, gym, not gymnasts, women's gymnasts are making tons of money on NIL, um, because they have these huge social media followings. They have the, you know, legions of little girls across the country who are do gymnastics and want to be the next, you know, Simone Biles. And the, you know, it's like they have millions and millions and millions of followers while they're doing gymnastics at in college. Um, and they're able to make tons of money, you know, and that's a, that's not a sport that you would necessarily put up there with, you know, uh, football, but you know, they're I, some of the highest earning you know, when you see like the top five list, like two out of the five are women's gymnastics. Wow. Where do you find those lists, Joe? Just online. You know, there's, there's companies, you know, a market has been created. So as soon as NIL passed, um, you know, then immediately there were five um, platforms uh, for athletes to go on and say like, I want to get an NIL deal. How can I do that? And so, uh, these platforms, I think one of them is called open doors. Uh, there's a couple other ones you go on and you put your information in, and then there are companies that, that, that they're working with who were, are there in order to like find some people to do deals with, and then it helps them match and they can do, you know, deals through there. So it's not like, you know, cash on the side of the street type thing. Um, and so that opened up and then there are, now there's websites that are like NIL deals tracker.com. And, you know, they're there. So everybody's keeping track of stuff and they're reporting open doors is reporting all the best deals because they want to promote their own business. So it's a, you know, the, the wild west opened up as soon as the, as soon as it was available. I bet. I bet. Is there any connection or considerations with title nine? And this aspect, are they totally exclusive or does one, does Title IX fit into this at all? 
There's a little bit of a crossover. Um, so explain big, what Title IX is, first of all. Title IX was passed in the 70s to create gender equity, you know, across all higher education. And athletics falls into that uh, because you have to provide the same opportunities for male and female uh, student athletes in your at, at any given school. Uh, and so that can look like it, you have to have the same composition as the student body, or you have to provide, there are a couple of different uh, ways that you can be Title IX uh, compliant, um, but it's very much directed at the athletic departments and the schools. Uh, and NIL is very much directed at the athletes individually and the businesses that they're uh, connected to. So they don't have to follow any NI or Title IX guidelines. Um, you know, the businesses don't have to make sure that they're giving, you know, every male athlete they give a deal to, they, you know, match to a female athlete. They, there's nothing for them to have to deal with. And, and you know, m the athletes don't have to worry about Title IX considerations. They're just dealing with it on an individual level. The athletic departments have to uh, keep to, you know, any, any resources they provide around, around NIL um, they have to make sure that that is equitable. So if they go in and do like a, you know, hey, here's a, you know, a, a, a one hour session on the, on the new NIL situation. And, you know, here's some education about this and that. They can't just go to the football team and do that presentation. Like they have to make sure that they're doing that equitably across the whole department to everybody. Um, and anything else, any other way that they are going to, you know, educate the students, um, provide resources, uh, they have to make sure that that's provided to all their athletes. That makes sense. That make that makes sense. So, um, I know that's a big issue. That whole compliance issue at the college level is is something that's always an ongoing yeah. process and concern yeah. and um, consideration. So you mentioned gymnasts, which was very surprising that that is a group of athletes that have really benefited. Are there any other groups of athletes that you've observed that have also benefited from this? So it's interesting. It's like, it, it, it hasn't quite rolled out as many expected. Uh, you know, there was a lot of consternation when it first happened, where it was just like, this is only going to be football players. You know, this is going to be football players. Men's basketball players might get a couple here and there. Um, but that's like essentially it. And all the money is going to go to these and it's going to be unfair. And women have done really well, um, which is, you know, which, which people didn't expect. And there, there are the standouts like the gymnasts who just have this natural, this natural fan base, you know, mm -hmm. when you're a success mm -hmm. because there's not a ton of gymnastics programs every four years you see, you know, these, the, the everybody who comes and watches the gymnastics is one of the most popular sports in the Olympics. Um, and you see these people come out of the college ranks and into the trials. And then you watch the trial. My, my wife was a gymnast. And so we watch the trials every year and then we see who's going to make the team and then they go to the Olympics. And, and so gymnastics has this natural fan base built in. It's an expensive sport. There's tons of gear that they have to get and there's gyms that they have to go to. And so companies are like, would love to get on the social media feeds of these gymnasts, you know, and, right. and be like, you know, I wear, right. you know, this, this wrist wrap. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, and so it's a, it, it leads itself perfectly to that. And, you know, a lot of female, young female athletes are just better at social media mm -hmm. yeah. than, than yeah. their male counterparts uh, and are better at self-promotion and, and are just like, as many counselors know, a little bit ahead of the game uh, when it comes to <laughs> it comes to the boys that they're competing with in the college <laughs> process. Um, and so I think I, I can't remember where I saw this stat, but you know, if you take those kind of like top earner quarterback football players out of it, mm -hmm. that, uh, that women, female athletes have actually, you know, done better on average uh, than, than uh, their counterparts. Uh, but then you, but you do also have those, the, you know, the quarterbacks and the, and those big time uh, football players who are making millions of dollars and throw and mm -hmm. skew it off. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's been, I think that's definitely been a surprise. 
Wow. That's so what do we as college advisors, you know, we have students now who are coming through our schools and looking at this and following some of these different athletes. So what should we be telling them or teaching them about this as they're they're looking at that as part of their future? So it's interesting because we we are pretty much never interacting with the million dollar athletes right like mm -hmm. the, you know it, i've never worked with you know uh the next quarterback for clemson like those guys are being identified when they're seven years old as you know they're six foot five when they're when they're in sixth grade and they're just amazing and you know it's like so this the, the kinds of students that and athletes that that counselors are going to work with are ones like me when I was in high school, you know, good players. We love it. We want to play in college. Some of them are D one, uh, ready. Uh, most of them are division two, II, division three, uh, level athletes and kind of approach the whole, the new NIL stuff as just like, I have, you know, like, how am I, I'm not going to make millions of dollars. You know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not on TV all the time. Um, you know, and it's really changing the mindset uh, of those types of students to say, like, you don't have this isn't going to benefit you only if you can make a million dollars, you know, like you could make a hundred dollars, you know, and a thousand dollars. And I remember, you know, I just think of myself as a college baseball player and all of my teammates, like we were incredibly broke all the time because you can't work. You know, like you have to be playing your sport 20, 20, 30 hours a week, plus going to a full load of classes. You know, you can't just have a job, uh, you know, a 30 hour a week job. It just doesn't work. Um, and NIL is can can help, you know, create opportunities for uh, for for kids. And it, it's been interesting to see uh, the sorts of small level deals that have been made. Um, you know, kids who uh, make deals with, uh, you know, nutrition bar companies, you know, like, yeah. like, yep. you know, to like, you know, met RX and, you know, protein bars and, uh, and granola and, you know, uh, local restaurants where it's like, Hey, the whole, you know, offensive line for this small school gets to eat for free here. And they post on their social media every time they go and they do these things. But like, if you gave me a restaurant in my <laughs> college town where I could eat for free while I was in college, it would have been, you know, the most life-changing thing that ever happened. You know, uh, we used to just go get uh, Little Caesars hot and ready pizzas for $5, like four days a week. And, you know, and, and it's like now if there's just a restaurant where we can go and have dinner every night, like mm -hmm. that would have been incredible. Um, and so you know, there's, there's, there's great opportunities for students at all levels to, to make these small deals and to just identify, identify their strengths, identify the ways that they're marketable, um, match up with a local business. It's generally local, um, and, and go out and, and make a deal. Um, and the other, I mean, the other big one for, uh, for athletes, like, you know, that we work with is, you know, a lot of times a kid that goes to, you know, um, no name university in, you know, in Iowa comes from a smaller town, uh, where they were the best volleyball player that the town had seen in 10 years, you mm -hmm. know, and they didn't make it to Penn state, but they made it to, you know, a, a division one division two school. Uh, and then they come back in the summer and there are kids who, would want to take a camp with them. And in previous, previously, they couldn't market that. You know, it's like, I couldn't have gone back to my hometown and been like, Joe Slater baseball camp. Really? Yeah, that was against the rules. That would have been me benefiting from my image and likeness. Um, hmm. And so now they can go back and they can say like, hey, it's the Joe Slater baseball camp, $50 a pop, get 50 kids to come out, you know, boom. Like that's- yeah, you've got your small town hero, you've got an opportunity to have the students interact and they have the role model. And yeah, um, yeah that's, 
So now can students start doing that in high school? Like if I'm a football player, volleyball player, or lacrosse, whatever, can I start doing that and then just take that on through to college? It's it's a little murkier in the high school world, but yes. I mean, you can't get punished for doing stuff like that. You don't become ineligible uh, for doing for promoting yourself. There are some rules like you can't use your school's um like logos and images or name, you know, it has to be you. It has to be, you need to be attracting it. You know, it's, it's Joe. It's not, you know, blank baseball player, Joe Slater, you know, is hosting this camp. It's like, you have to be able to use your own cachet uh, Mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are other like minor, minor things like that. But, um, but yes, in general, um, high school athletes also benefit from this. Oh, nice. So when we have parents come in and think their kids are going to make all these millions of dollars on their names and likeness because they're the big fish and the small pond, yeah. you know, any other words of advice for counselors to give? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the this is not, a, in general, this is not going to make millions of dollars. You know, in, in the same way that the first conversation with student athlete families that I always have is like, they come in and they're like, we would like a scholarship to play sport in college you know it's like a full scholarship please and that's just not the way that the that it works like you know the the there's only a few sports that give full scholarships the vast 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 majority even of division one uh athletes are not on full scholarship um you know the average scholarship in uh in uh, division one is like ten thousand dollars um you know, and as everybody knows, the cost of college is far higher than $10,000. And I think, I mean, it's something like 2% of high school athletes are the ones who get that $10,000 scholarship, you know, 98% don't, and, you know, a very, and so the vast majority and, and more, the most athletes, uh, in, in college sports are playing in division three, which gives no athletic scholarships. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing that I always do is kind of take away that expectation, you know, and, and, and be like, Hey, like this, that can't be the goal, you know, because it's very, you know, it's very hard to attain and it's very unlikely. And, and you'll, you'll find yourself chasing the wrong criteria. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're just here to be like, I want college to get paid for Um, and it's the same in NIL, you know, it's like, if you're most of the people that you're working with, they're not going to make tons and tons and tons of money on NIL, but they can, you know, get to the right place and then figure out a way to, to improve their lives a little bit with it. Yeah. Well, and it's nice that it does open up some options and opportunities. And, you know, I have a student, he is, and he's not in an organized sport. He, he is doing, he's skier. He does, he picked up um, rock climbing once he went to college and he's already picked up two sponsors. One's a, a granola bar type of thing. And the other one's a sport drink, but it gives him a little bit of cash in his pocket and, you know, and he's building that, um, that, that opportunity to have sponsors. So, um, it is nice. It's, it's a nice opportunity for students. Joe, if somebody has questions or want to learn a little bit more about this, how do they reach you? Uh, so I have, you know, my company Slater admissions advising, um, you know, of a website, um, and then, uh, you know, email is the, is always the easiest way. And then I'm also a member of, uh, a collective, um, the student athlete advisors, uh, four of us who have a website, um, you know, and provide resources for anybody who is interested in learning more about guy, you know, it's, it's counselor focused. Um, so we're talking to counselors and, 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 you know, doing uh, blog posts and, uh, and classes and things like that for people who want to learn more about the athletic recruiting world, the process, uh, putting together like a course, uh, for, for people who want to get more, uh, more involved with student athletes. Um, and then, you know, just kind of promoting really the three ways as you get out there and get into the world, like you said, at the beginning, people ask about athletics all the time and, um, you know, kind of trying to promote 
the idea that uh, there's really three different ways to handle it, um, which is, uh, you know, partnering with someone like me, like the student athlete advisors um, to co-counsel. So if you're not super, uh, you know, versed in, uh, in athletics and you don't really want to be, um, you know, bringing somebody in, but you also don't want to lose the business of the kid who comes in and says, I want to play, uh, play baseball in college. Um, you know, you can reach out to us and we can, you know, work together to, uh, where it's like, Hey, you handle the academic side, we'll handle the athletic side. And then we'll kind of, you know, collaborate, uh, and co-counsel the student together. Um, and then there's mentoring, uh, which is, I do, I am interested in athletics. I do want to learn more about it. I would love to help kids, you know, help kids through the recruiting process, um, you know, find some, find somebody who will help you through that. I, I know when I started this, like I have as much credibility in the industry as, as anybody having been a division one coach and worked in an administration for a long time. And I walked into this and somebody was like, I'm a golfer. <laughs> and I was like, I have no idea what golf recruiting is. You know, it's like, I've done baseball. I've got all these contacts of, you know, I understand this completely, but golf's a completely different sport. And I was like, whoa, I don't know anything about this. And so I found a, a somebody who works with golfers specifically and, you know, went and took her out to, to lunch and asked a million questions. And then, and I still, you know, uh, hit her all the time when I work with a golfer to just say like, uh, you know, Hey, should they go to play in this tournament or should they do this? Or how does that work? Um, and so finding someone, a mentor, um, you know, like me, like the student athlete advisors to, to help, you know, uh, take you through some of those, uh, those sticking points and give you ideas. Um, and then referral is the, you know, once you get to a point where you're full, you know, uh, and you get to be a little bit more discerning about who you take on, uh, you know, just saying like, hey, you, if you want to work with an, uh, somebody who knows more about athletics than me, you know, here's, here's these people. So that's great. Lots of choices. Do you, does student athletic advisors partner with schools, high schools as well? Um, I know the courses and things are for anybody, school, public, private, independent, um, do you also partner with um, schools to to provide yeah, we that? Yeah, uh, we do educational workshops for uh, for schools and for club programs and, you know, school counselors, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's just something that, you know, most schools don't know, you know, most school-based counselors don't have any real interaction with the athletic world. Um, and they're so busy, you know, with, uh, with, with their caseload that that's not, you know, they're not out there taking classes or, you know, doing mentorships. Um, and so, yeah, we come in a lot of times and you give talks and just, you know, it's like, Hey, to a team, to a department, to booster clubs, to parent groups, things like mm -hmm. that. And just say like, Hey, here's what to expect. Um, you know, if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior it's a one hour, you know, like, like here's the basics, uh, you know, let us know if you have questions. Great. Great. One thing I meant to ask, and then we're going to wrap up, is does all of this apply to international students as well as domestic students? Yeah. Yeah. Like the name, image, and likeness mm -hmm. piece. Um, yes, it was. That was always a real sticking point for um, international students because, you know, and it still is so because there's just different rules out there. Like there isn't really high school sports in a lot of countries it's club. Everything is club and they pay their athletes a lot of times. And so those athletes still sh can't have been just paid for to play, you know, like, so, uh, you know, water polo players from, from Croatia, you know, who are great and who want to come play in America. A lot of times we're offered money to play for different clubs when they were 13 years old and, you know, wow. So that's still illegal. Um, well, not illegal, but it, it will ruin your amateurism. Um, mm -hmm. But they can profit off of their name. You know, it's like they could do the same thing. They could promote themselves on social media. They could make deals with businesses. Sounds like another thing that, you know, as time rolls forth, that will, you know, roll out and that will 
become other topics and things that we'll see other variations on that. So sounds like something we'll readdress in a couple of years and see where everything is, right? Joe, yeah. so thank you very much. This has been very informative and appreciate your time and your expertise and um, look forward to talking with you about this again in the future. Awesome. That was great. Thank you.